Welcome back, everybody, to the symposium. We're going to resume now with our second session. Our next speaker is Dr. Russell Jessup. Dr. Jessup is an assistant professor in the Texas A&M University Department of Soil and Crop Sciences. He is a member of the plant breeding faculty where he works with perennial grass breeding. His breeding program utilizes molecular, cytogenetics, and classical methods to improve perennial grasses for biofuels, turf grasses, phytoremediators, and ornamentals. Dr. Jessup's presentation today is titled, Biorefining Perennial Grasses, Sustainability via Disruptive Breeding. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Russell Jessup. All right, thank you all for returning. As you can see from the title, it's a bit vague and abstract compared to what you've seen. As you can see from my pictures, I've done a very good job of complicating my job description. And I think that has helped me uh, on a daily basis think both large and small based on the grasses I breed. And as a result, uh, I've had the opportunity or the requirement to think about alternative uses for our crops uh, beyond the primary commodities we typically think of them as. And I tend to think of that as a disruptive concept. And most people think of perennial grasses and perennial systems and envision something that might be sustainable. Uh, sustainability is too often jargon tossed around and not followed much upon. Uh, so in, in re that respect, I'll touch on that as well with this talk. But, but in the end, my hope is to focus this more towards the graduate students. So for the PIs and the retired guys, I apologize. Uh, my hope is to try to give the graduate students something to think about as they go out in their careers. OK? So Brian Pfeiffer mentioned the, the concept of this meeting was reading in a modern era. Uh, some people I know would say we're in a postmodern era, whatever the heck that is. Uh, but in the end, we're focusing on plant breeding in the future, going forward. And if you think about what was presented earlier, plant breeding began with the first person that picked up a seed and intentionally put it in their pocket or whatever they had to carry it in and put it back somewhere else. Uh, so from that point on, agriculture has been extremely disruptive to our ecosystems and to our civilization. Okay, and from that point, we've moved from uh, machining our own tools and, and gathering and using any widget or technology we can get our hands on. Uh, most drastically in the last couple of hundred years with the advent of electricity, internal combustion engines, and most recently uh, digital technologies, which were very high, we talked about in previous presentations. Within that, we can think about agriculture itself being a disruptive process. And as the example in crops, we all show corn, grain yields in the U.S. historically. It's very incremental on most years, very, very uh, small gains, sustaining, very important to maintain what we have. At certain time points, we have large changes in the systems. Now you can think of double cross hybrids when they came out. You can think about single cross hybrids in the 50s, uh, in the 90s, GMO or transgenic products that have come on the market that are somewhat trending upward in yields as well. So you think about those individual discrete events that cause dramatic changes in markets or technologies, uh, those are disruptive by nature. Okay. And when you make something that is disruptive, you have ones that can be accepted by the public and therefore you have captured the value or you have some that might be similar to an Etzel or a Chevy Volt or something that is beyond the price range but we're willing to accept. So you always have to think about what is consumer driven or market driven. Uh, and beyond that, what you're going to create as a breeder might be something that is incremental, small steps. It could be something that is a little more substantial. And the example I would show is the, the Tom Tato, the graph between a hybrid uh, tomato and potato, something that's interesting or substantial. Uh, two technologies that are more radical, okay, bioluminescence in plants and all of the diverse applications we might use with those. Right? 
in the end, when you have a disruptive technology as a breeder, you're going to have your job description. You're not going to have the latitude I have as a university professor to go in any direction you might see fit. You're going to have a focus. You're going to have an entrenched establishment that's going to say focus on this, focus on that. Uh, you're going to have resistance or barriers. Okay, the, the trick as a breeder to try to be disruptive would be to try to overcome those, go around them, through them, uh, any way or manner you can think of. All right. Most of that resistance comes from one thing, right? The need to keep going, to keep to have resources, to have the bottom line. All right. So economics drives most of our industries in plant breeding. I don't know if there are any ecologists here. Most of us also have spouses or friends or others in our family who say, well, why aren't you breeding for the environment? So you have the other side of the fence that says, save all things that are cute and cuddly. Okay? Somewhere in the middle, we can make a decision based on values versus our value systems and try to work within those as plant breeders. All right? So getting back to sustainability. A lot of people that are, that are of a certain age might say you can never achieve sustainability as, as a plant breeder. Uh, I would simply say that it's a hard target to hit because you're having to satisfy a lot of different interests, those disparate interests that I mentioned. And uh, you have to satisfy those that are economically feasible, those that are viable, and those that can be accepted by your social concepts. Right? So as you can see, it's a very small target to hit. Uh, but if you can do that, you will actually have something of uh, value. Okay, so perennial grasses, when I'm talking about those, it's predominantly thought of as biomass. Can biomass give us a sustainable, disruptive product on the plant breeding market? And I would say absolutely yes. People say we're using all the lands we have, we're, we're maximizing our crop production. I would say take a larger view, look from a satellite. You can see from NASA's interpretation, most of the world is using less than 10 to 20 percent of the net carbon that is assimilated in plants on the terrestrial land mass of this, this planet, okay? irrespective of the two-thirds of the water on this planet. So there is a large amount of biomass that we are not yet appropriating for our own purposes. Okay? To be more specific, the sum of everything we use for food, feed, fiber, uh, and fuel today, roughly 4% of what's on the land mass. Okay? Predictions of 2050, we're supposed to double our food production for the, the coming masses and produce more biomass for biofuels or bioenergy. Those estimates only get us up to about 15% of the biomass on the planet today. So I would say biomass is a great opportunity for us to improve uh, what we have in our technologies, in our industries. Okay? And it's simply from not thinking of biomass as a discrete single entity, but thinking of it as a backbone, a refining platform, okay? a carbohydrate uh, polymer that can be utilized in many, many ways. All right? And this is simply meant to show you the main fractions in biomass that can be utilized and the diverse array of products that can be used from those as endpoints. All right? You've got the protein, oil, lignin. This is your polymer backbone. You've got starches. Not shown here. You have minerals. You have all sorts of things in that plant as you stare at it uh, as a biorefinery. We're all guilty this morning of, of contributing to this problem, right? Plastics, one of the, one of the slowest molecules we have to, to biodegrade and decompose on this planet. It is a carbon-based polymer made from petroleum products. Can it be made from biomass? Absolutely. It's been made from biomass throughout the decades. Okay? Earlier versions are from starch. You can see Henry Ford hitting a taillight uh, from a soy oil and starch composite. You can make things that look, uh, if you're a horticulture, your ground cover, your shade barriers, a lot of those now are poly polylactic acids made from sugars that partially degrade, organic. You have uh, several that are basically linear polyesters. Okay? You have others that are used for containers, bags, wipes. A lot of these are more on the market. So to an extent, these are already starting to emerge in our market as biomass-derived products. Okay? Beyond making simple plastics, right, low, low, low individual value, a lot of these companies are also looking at higher value resins, things that go in your cosmetics, things you put in your car, things they use for petroleum refining. So high value 
secondary products that can be uh, developed from biomass. Okay. If you ever have a house you've seen that has what they call hardy panel as the exterior, a lot of hardy panel these days have organic fibers in them okay, from various plant materials. So you can actually have fiber crete. This has been developed much more thoroughly in Europe and Asia than the United States, but you actually have a diverse array of polymer products, containers, vessels, walls, building structures, uh, and even paper from biomass, from perennial grasses. Right. Silica, this is one of my favorites. Silica is used in all of our smartphones, all of your computers. It's used in the soles of your shoes and the rubber. Uh, the Guayel, the car product. Almost 30% of any tire these days is made of amorphous silica. Okay. Most silica we use today is mined from the ground from, from, from minerals. It is beginning to be used via rice holes. Rice holes to keep disease pathogens out have a high content of silica and they can be burned. That ash can be refined, silica mined from that and utilized for these purposes. And a lot of perennial grasses have much higher levels of silica than we think of. Most plants have 1 to 2%. Uh, there are perennial grasses that have 7 to 8%. All right. Protein, again, I, I would be an advocate of saying that if you're going to feed the world in 2050, we need to stop just looking at maize for the top one-third of biomass that's in grain. There's another third of that plant that is in the stalk and the leaf matter. That's a high level of protein in it. Many countries already use leaf protein concentrates for a variety of products, either for exercise supplements or actual full, full meals. Okay, and some of the grasses we work with uh, are well known to have as much protein as alfalfa, 15 or more percent crude protein, all of which can be utilized not only by animals, by us as well. All right. if you all are fans of yogurt. If you've eaten a yogurt that has the letters FOS on it, that's an oligosaccharide. That is a, a, a polysaccharide that has 2 to 10 sugar units that we cannot digest. But certain advantageous microbes in your intestines can. And you encourage those to grow. You're improving your own immune system and your own, your own health. Okay? You can develop these same types of oligosaccharides from biomass. Partial depolymerization of that lignocellulosic material. So a much larger pool from which to derive these products. Nutrients. If you, have, if you all have ever seen a feed cube you give to a cattle or to a horse, those are whole plant concentrated nutrients or vitamins that you give to them. In Europe, they actually make vitamins out of whole plant ingredients, not man-made synthetic ones. Okay. So thinking about leaf nutrient concentrates, not just leaf protein concentrates, you can potentially address issues that have been talked about on the preceding presentations here. Crude liquid extract from leaves can in include large amounts of bioavailable vitamins. And the two I point to here, vitamin A, as we talked about, and folic acid, both very critical, very hard to transport once it's, once it's developed. If you grow the perennial grass on site, make your crude extract and pulp it, you can have the vitamins on location uh, by any producer. So what of a disruptive concept, but to me, the biomass is there, the vitamins are there. It's just a matter of a bit of a paradigm shift. Right. In addition to nutrients for us, you can actually use biomass residues to recapture some of the macronutrients that plants require. Uh, there are companies in Japan or Asia as well as Northern Europe that reclaim macronutrients for plants for biofertilizers. One of my favorite slides, a lot of work has been done using grasses to pull up lead, heavy metals, uh, hazardous materials from polluted sites, super sites, environmental cleanup sites. You can also envision other things that perennial grasses can pull up or biomineralize from the soil that may not be negative in value but positive in value. Okay? And it's simply a matter of growing the biomass, harvesting it after it has translocated to the above ground biomass, smelting it, and recapturing your, your valuable minerals. All right. One of the most contentious things that plants can accumulate, right? 
Whether the debate is over how much CO2 is in the atmosphere or what it might be causing or not causing, the last 60 years we've increased carbon in the atmosphere 80 parts per million. If you look at a geological time point, most of Earth's history we've had carbon above that, irrespective of temperature. So whether carbon is affecting our, our climate or not from a geological standpoint has not been confirmed in my mind. However, if you want to address the change we have caused in our own emissions over the last few decades, several options. We can all agree to hold our breath for one hour a day or each hour on the hour when we're awake, see if that helps. Okay. You can also try to improve soil organic matter, soil organic carbon. This is a concept that's not new. Before we were tilling up the Great Plains, we had 5 to 8 percent organic matter. Now we have one or less. Okay. Simple math, average soil density, average soil depth, number of acres on the globe, one, one and a half percent increase in soil organic matter. If we did that across the, all the cropland that we utilize, we could recapture the 80 parts per million we're worried about being increased in our atmosphere. So one and a half percent, not a large number, shouldn't be a hard target. But again, it tends to take a decade or two. So longer term projects, sustainable projects. As an alternative, there are crops that put lots of biomass below ground, perennial structures. Okay, in my world, those are rhizomes. Okay, you have plants that put as much biomass or more biomass below ground than they do above ground. Okay, one of our favorite weed species, Johnson grass, can have two thirds of its biomass below ground. If you want to capture carbon and sequester it there, you can actually do so in one year. Okay, so we could capture a large portion of that 80 parts per million simply by focusing on developing perennial grass crops, however we want to use the biomass above ground, that also incorporate rhizomes. All right. One of the easiest ways to prevent increasing CO2 in our atmosphere is to stop putting more there, right? If anyone in here thinks they're, they're against biofuels, I would say you might be a bit in denial. All of us are surrounded by biofuels. We utilize biofuels daily. Uh, we are inundated by them. So I simply refer to those as fossil biofuels, those derived from phytoplankton and sequestered geologically. Okay. A simple shift from utilizing those to ones that are already in our ecosystem, ones that are renewable, could offset a lot of those CO2 emissions. The trend is not going to change anytime soon. We, we use, utilize these fossil biofuels significantly. We like to put a lot of interest and a lot of advertising into alternative energies. They've not really much, made much of a dent uh, to date. Even in the U.S., the sum of all solar, hydrological, nuclear, less than 10 percent, all renewable, less than 6. Of that, biomass is currently uh, half. In the U.S., it's very common. You have a coal refinery. You're penalized for emissions to put in 5, maybe 10 percent biomass as a coal fire to improve your emissions from that. Some countries, Pacific Islands, Caribbean Islands that don't have their own natural gas or coal, don't want to import oil because it costs too much, will actually burn biomass and generate electricity directly from that biomass. Wide range of liquid fuels you can make from biomass. Okay. Ethanol, we're very familiar with that for our own entertainment. That can also be put into cars. All right. Since the 70s, the last energy crisis that was done from starch or sugarcane, if you look at either of those, we are not capturing very much of the energy in that carbohydrate polymer to convert into ethanol. If you're willing to break down the cellulose and hemicellulose and a portion of the lignin, you can increase that and actually get over 60 percent of the biomass converted into ethanol. All right. If you want to try to go one step further, you can simply combine two ethanol molecules into a butanol. Again, done with microbes. And you have something with a higher energy content and something can be put directly into pipelines, so a better transportation liquid fuel. Biodiesel. Oil seed biodiesel is a niche market. It's never going to get more than 2 or 3 percent of our fuel consumption. 
You can make biodiesel from biomass without utilizing or taking anything away from soybean or canola or other oil markets. Again, it's simply a matter of pretreatment, depolymerization, and, and microbial fermentation into longer chain alkanes. You can make methane. This occurs in ruminants worldwide every day. We can mimic that process in large enclosed anaerobic incubators or large beds that you will see covered to capture the methane. Once you have that biogas, you can convert that into ethanol, into other molecules uh, of value. Okay. So our program within biofuels at A&M, we think the best target is going to be where you have ample water and growing degree, growing degree days in the United States, southeastern U.S. And there has been more than two decades of work directly on biomass crops for bioenergy. Most of them have focused on temperate grasses and trying to push them south. And they have largely failed to produce the biomass required to be economically viable. Most of the ones in our program are focused in tropical or subtropical species that have the high growth rates that can accumulate biomass that's needed. And it's much easier to simply develop those with improved cold tolerance. Okay. And Texas, within that bioenergy belt, is uniquely positioned where we have the edge of that moisture gradient where we think it's going to be viable for biofuels. So we can test our feedstocks for biomass production on the I-35 corridor all the way to Beaumont and have a range of 30 inches of rainfall a year uh, difference. And again, perennial grasses, they have a longer growing season. They're going to have a better opportunity to capture the CO2. In general, they will have a larger partition or a sink for below ground sequestration of that biomass. They will either naturally senesce and repartition those nutrients below ground or they will leach below ground compared to annuals. And I learned working on Miscanthus, very hard object lesson, after two years of developing a nice, very tall seeded biomass crop that it can spread, float around. No one wants to commercialize it. So it's very important to balance uh, concerns for biomass accumulation and sustainability. And examples I have there are simply some of the perennial grasses that we utilize for both crops uh, that might actually be weeds, Bermuda grass, as you can see, very popular forage grass, very, very successful turf grass, one of the top 10 most invasive plants in the world. All right, second largest mitigating factor that's going to develop, going to prevent uh, how much biomass you can develop is going to be water resources. And Texas, again, is in a great place to be able to calculate how much you can accumulate per unit of water. Right? So trying to balance things that are, are sustainable, non-invasive, and water use efficient or nutrient use efficient. One of the crops we focus on is synonymous with triplewood crops that we eat every day. We all love our seedless grapes, our bananas, our seedless watermelons. All of those are hybrids. What we're actually eating is a sterile triploid with three sets of chromosomes. And triploids have the advantage of having Zero, zero fertility, complete sterility, along with high levels of biomass production. Some biomass crops, higher levels of chromosome, you're never going to get sterility. Okay, so the triploid level is ideal uh, to work with. And in that respect, it's, it's very, very synonymous with seedless watermelons. Okay, you make the cross, you can get a lot of seed off of that parent, plant that seed, which you actually grow is going to have biomass alone. All right, pearl millet. This is synonymous with corn, if you aren't familiar with it. It's synonymous with sorghum. It is a row crop, treated as an annual. It's a tropical grass. Produces a large amount of grain on top. Very drought tolerant, very heat tolerant. Can be crossed with a very tall, very robust, high biomass perennial. It actually has twice the chromosomes. The very interesting thing is that one of the sets of chromosomes in this wild grass or napier grass is syntenic with pro millet. So that allows the chromosomes to pair synapse 
and allow seed production to occur. That seed is triploid, and when it grows in the field, it is sterile. So you will not have seed generating seed weed propagules. And again, very high biomass potential in that actual triploid hybrid. All right. One of the biggest issues we have is we don't live far enough south. Napier grass like sugarcane is photoperiodic. It's not going to flower until the days are significantly short. Okay. Barring, barring a winter nursery in Puerto Rico or Costa Rica, which I've not been able to do yet, we've had some success in Westlico. If you're not familiar with that location, it's three miles from the border with Mexico. Okay, so some of our napier grasses, we can get to flower there. And as you can see, napier grass is planted on the outside. This is a 10 to 12 foot tall plant, pearl millet in between those. All right. So the perennial millets we developed have no history of herbicide safety or effects. Uh, we have determined several herbicides that are safe to use on it post-emergent. We've also developed protocols to get rid of the crop. If you want to get out of this crop and get it back into your, your, your maize, what we're still lacking on are pre-emerge options. We're still expanding upon tests of those, but we are hopeful. Okay. We've completed trials of our very first generation PMN hybrids, and we have good yield data at three locations across that rainfall gradient in Texas uh, and fairly high yield potential of this for biomass. We've also started working on trying to, trying to quantify how much biomass you can generate per unit of nitrogen, be it inorganic or winter legumes, as well as how much biomass we can accumulate per unit of water. And not only for our perennial millets, but also for annual sorghum and for switchgrass, one of the temperate biomass including crops. All right. And if you've ever worked with a very small seed of crop, one of the things you notice, especially in areas uh, where you have heavy clay soils, you get crusting either from the salt or from the depth of the clay itself, seed will not emerge. Uh, so we've been working on trying to develop pellets, the pellets with multiple seeds. So you have the combined force of those seeds to emerge from the soil crust. All right. And as you're all plant breeders, you know you might find use in reciprocal crosses. Okay. Same hybrid, different cytoplasms. We've utilized that and, and investigated whether it can be uh, utilized or not based on literature. And we've identified one of the napier grasses that is actually genetically male sterile. So you can see it has the intact stigma, style ovary, it has no anthers. So it's very useful to use this as a female uh, in this version of our perennial millet crosses. The difficult part being the seed are very tiny. They make Bermuda grass seed look tiny, look large. If you've noticed from the pictures I've shown before, both versions of those hybrids look very similar, right? They're very tall grasses, lots of tillers, and very diverse at a smaller scale. We've utilized markers to be able to identify species-specific as well as even some cultivar-specific markers. All right. So thinking about biomass and production, perennial millets are unique on the top row here. Nothing else will get you anywhere near a triploid sterile hybrid that are so successful in grapes, bananas, watermelons. Okay. And if you're thinking of a seed company, this gives you control of the seed. Whatever you sell, the farmer's not going to be able to replant. If you're thinking of trying to support small stakeholder farmers in other countries, they could cut up the plant and propagate it vegetatively. That would not significantly affect your seed business and still give them a sustainable method to propagate it. Uh, beyond that, the, the perennial millets are tropical, so you can get a lot of yield in the first year, unlike three years for waiting for the temperates. They are perennial and largely non-invasive. Okay? As plant breeders, if you're working with a hybrid crop, you have to work with both parents, right? One of the models to increase biomass per unit area is to have leaf angle and tiller number or plant density. Okay, we've done that in the millet side. Most per millet has one, maybe two stalks. Uh, we have some that have over 100 tillers or combs per plant now. And those plants were fertile, so hard to work with. We're actually in the process of putting those into sterile cytoplasms and utilizing markers to help us speed up that process. 
So by the end of this year, we hope to have the, um, the first biofuel biomass AB pair of pearl millet. Okay. Most of our work with the napier grasses have been after the tall types, not the forage types. There are several dwarf, so as a plant breeder, these are ones that are all leaf, very little internode. Okay. And again, the napier grass, just like the millet, we've gone after tiller density and leaf angle and plant erectness. And trying to approach what you have with corn and sorghum and inbred crops, we try to develop inbreds on the napier grass side as well. And unlike crops where this has failed in, in perennial grasses, such as switchgrass, we've gotten the second generation of inbreds and they still look very nice. So we're hopeful uh, we will be able to have true breeding millet hybrids eventually. Napier grass in its own right is, is a biomass crop. So not only using it for a hybrid, we've also developed it as its own biomass feedstock propagated by combs, very similar to sugarcane, and have very nice yields. And as you can see, again, erect plants, tiller density, uh, with graduate students avoiding work. All right. We've also tried to work with legumes. If there are any legume breeders here, I would love input or advice. South America and Africa have both been successful with growing napier grass with climbing legumes, warm season plants. And those actually give you a yield bonus for the combined biomass of the plot. We've not been able to duplicate that in Texas. We've tried over a dozen. Some of these may seem a bit strange. We've tried everything, everything in the toolbox. And most of them simply can't survive the hot Texas summers. Right. So I mentioned trying to push the biomass crops that are subtropical in nature north. Even though napier grass typically won't survive much further north than College Station, other related species can survive much, much further north. Uh, so we've also been trying to work with making hybrids, interspecific hybrids between them. Right. We got lucky the first year. We actually had some seedlings develop. Didn't last long. They died as seedlings. We confirmed with markers they were of hybrids, uh, so we were very hopeful. We've not been able to repeat that. So we've had students trying to look at where the fertility barrier is occurring in those wide hybrids. And good news is we actually have pollen growth on hybridization from those wild species on the napier all the way to the micropile. We've not gotten seed. So we're speculating it's a post-fertilization barrier. Upon that, we've had students embark upon embryo rescue. If you, if you all have not attempted that, it's a great project where you make a pollination, you actually dissect out the florets and put them on media. That's a very tedious and time consuming. Several variants of that approach have also not been successful. So as a fallback, every graduate student here, you probably had multiple experiments, right? And all of them have worked. So we've had students where the fallback was to work on just breeding for the overwintering propagule, the rhizomes in napier grass. So if you think of Bermuda grass or Johnson grass as being highly rhizominous, um, napier grass is a one or two. Not many rhizomes there. Okay. We have been able to select those that have more rhizome potential. We have pushed them up basically two adaptation zones in the United States. So from here in College Station, 8B all the way to 7A up in the panhandle. All right. And that's just a picture from our Vernon location where you can see we still have very nice high biomass types that can overwinter that far north. And we've actually had students looking at specific Canada genes that we know might be involved with short-term, long-term cold stress, as well as nutrient partitioning, might be important for rhizomes to survive and uh, green up in the spring. All right. So the perennial millets, we, we have a lot of hope for. For any of the biofuels pipelines, and again, for silica, I mentioned that we could put 7% silica from napier grass. I'm going to pass out a, a sample of that. So if you think about rice hulls, that's 20% that's of 3% of the overall biomass of that crop. You're looking at a couple hundred pounds of silica per acre. If you look at napier grass, 17 dry tons, and you get 7%, you're talking over, over a ton of silica per acre. So a huge potential to get silica. from these crops. 
And if nothing else, is try to, try to plant a, a seed in the graduate students' minds when they leave here to not just think about the presentation. Try to try, try take, take something away with it uh, when you go. And again, protein. You can have over two tons of protein in an acre of napier grass. It's simply a matter of taking it out of there and putting it to use for our purposes. Fiber, bioplastics, all of those can be derived as well. That said, I mentioned those barriers to plant breeding, right? PMN is a new crop. Even with all the tools we have with our perennial millets, there's no guarantee it's going to work. We think by the end of this year we're going to have all the tools. We usually go in a toolkit for most mature crops. Whether it's actually adopted, we'll see. Okay, so beyond the, the perennial millets, again, I, I try to work on lots of different grasses. Better odds of keeping my job. All right? And with all of this, I try to be disruptive. This tends to be a lower funded position, harder to get research funding. I don't have the GWAS uh, platforms to my, to my benefit. So perennial sorghum, there's not a sorghum seed company in the world that would give me a penny to work on this, but perennial sorghum, I would say the value has already been created. Johnson grass is everywhere. Okay? It's simply a matter of capturing that value. So perennial sorghum to me is a case of perennial crops where the value has not been captured. We have developed uh, two different types of perennial sorghums. One is sterile. It's never going to have a seed on it, so it's not going to have the problem of shatter cane spreading by seed. And if you think back to the carbon sequestration potential, this crop spreads half as much as Johnson grass, but it can still put uh, a lot of biomass below ground in rhizomes and be propagated via those rhizomes. And as you can see, it's a fairly substantial biomass crop above ground as well. Okay, we also have very high biomass perennial sorghums that are seeded, yet don't flower until November here in Texas. They give you a degree of operational sterility, very similar to what sorghum companies use today for their hybrid photoperiodic sorghums, with the exception being that this is perennial. Okay, so thinking small, thinking turf grass, I do do that as well. We tried to work on St. Augustine grass. Two-thirds, three-quarters of all turf grass in the state of Texas is St. Augustine grass. None of it's propagated from seed. It's all from sod. Okay, so looking upon problems they've had in the past and trying to work within those, we've done several things to try to improve uniformity, stress tolerance, and, of course, seed production. Useful in row crops as well as turf grasses, plants that will have delayed senescence, delayed chlorophyll degradation, or if you're going to turf grass, plants that homeowners won't want to go out and water quite as frequently. Okay. Working on mutants that are stay green. And this is just a picture on the bottom of turf grasses that are in four-inch pots, have not had water for two months. So that, that soil has been a solid crust for over 30 days, and some plants that were still green. Trying to develop mutant platforms or mutant populations in turf grasses has not been done before. Very common in row crops, okay, starting with diploid turf grasses and moving on to the polyploids from there. Some work in ornamentals in our program that are somewhat disruptive. A lot of people like variegated perennial grasses in their yards. Okay. None of those are turf grasses yet, but they might be. You guys are going to go into academia. You may actually have to work about, worry about your curricula. Nothing saying you have to always go up and talk, about, talk from PowerPoint slides, right? Like we're doing today. Be disruptive in your curriculum. Both the courses I've been asked to teach are website driven. They're distance courses. They're courses that are somewhat atypical. Uh, if you all are on campus here, you, you've used eCampus, you have strong opinions one way or another. Uh, with these types of courses, you can avoid that. And if you are faculty fighting with eCampus or fighting with these platforms, it's a way to avoid some of the bureaucratic hoops that we deal with. All right. With that, I know I finished early. I always do. I will stop being disruptive and entertain any feedback or questions.
Once again, we have approximately 10 minutes for questions. So if anybody in the audience has a question, raise your hand. And Amanda has the microphone in the back. She'll bring it to you. Also, to our webinar attendees, if you have questions, please type them in to the chat box on the GoToWebinar platform right now. So questions? Dr. Murray is always first. So, so, so Russ, uh, as a as a corn breeder, um, you know, grasses, perennial grasses, could disrupt a lot of our our landscape. And you know, I thought it was going to happen with this last generation of biofuels. What do you, when do you predict, or what do you think it's really going to take for growers to to stop planting corn and start planting perennial grasses? We're all enjoying our current gasoline prices, right? I think it needs to go back to where it was before. That's the easiest solution. The, it's funny to me, I've been working on biofuels for seven years now, and when I started in 07 within the industry, they said as long as oil was $75 a barrel, we could compete with it. We could, we could beat out corn starch ethanol. Okay? Well, it never really got much above that, so it was always very close. Coming here to A&M, it was always in the realm between $70 to $80 a barrel of oil to be competitive. Now with it at 40 to 50, it's not competitive. So either oil has to go up, or some of you all have to be better biochemists and figure out how to better depolymerize lignin. We're very good at depolymerizing cellulose and hemicellulose. We can use all the free sugars. What we're missing is the lignin fraction. So if someone can, someone can conquer that disruptive barrier, then we can compete. A very good, very good question. Uh, hello. Uh, so is this... Uh Permulate and a Napier grass cross, triplet cross, somebody stumbled on this or has this been known for years? I have another follow-up question. It's been known for decades. I'm, I'm walking on the shoulders of Glenn Burton. He demonstrated you could make this cross and produce seed in the 1940s. So again, it gets back to those barriers you have to overcome. And there were river researchers trying to produce seed of this hybrid in the 80s in the United States and in Hawaii. And they were able to get a fair amount of seed but again, getting back to Dr. Murray's question, it never got adoption from producers. So we're trying to incorporate more uniform crops, better hybrid vigor, better architecture and the parents on both sides uh, to give a better package for producers and seed companies to adopt. Great. Another follow-up question, I think uh, Dr. Lloyd Rooney is here too. The pro-millet I verified actually some the variety has uh, tannings, right? So have you looked at uh, actually when you design your cross, a reciprocal cross, will that, if you're using the pro millet as the female parents that has tanning, will that be able to increase your coat tolerance? Because we did earlier work in sorghum that we just can't, you know, it's very challenging to get a coat tolerant sorghum that has no tanning. But you, you could do that, but those tanning sorghums are really, you know, germinating emergence much better than these non-tanning ones. We've not looked at that. I have no idea. All of our perennial circuits have been focused upon biomass, how to propagate them, and overall stress tolerance. Are there any other questions? Everybody must be very hungry, I think. All right, let's thank Dr. Jessup one more time for his presentation.